Hello, welcome to the April 10th, 2023 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, my name is Greg Undo and I'll be the host of the live stream today. Uh, if you've not attended a live stream before, let me just view my other monitor computer. Sorry about that. All right, so if, you're not a, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is we can submit questions in the live chat field, or you can email questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Uh, when asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase you're running, whether it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, which version number, so if it's 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, and which operating system, that information would be helpful. Uh, my ability to answer questions in real time will soon be eclipsed by the number of questions. I'll try my best throughout the uh, live stream to to get caught up. But if you don't see an immediate response to your question, if we could try to hold off uh, until the, um, the un, you know, if we could try to hold off repeating the same question over and over again, that would be appreciated. Just kind of allows us to get through more questions, and we'll try to go through each of the questions chronologically. Um, and we should have a top, we should have, uh, if you look at the video left after the live stream, and if you go to the top, we should see all the topics that were covered with timestamps in, in the link. So you could navigate quickly to different timestamps. Um, if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com. We want to thank Jan from Stockholm for creating that website. Uh, we also want to give special thanks to our two moderators uh, that often help and a wonderful resource to the community, uh, to Agent K and to Jazz Dude. And we'll give special kudos to Jazz Dude for his work with the Cubase Nation Discord, uh, which is a wonderful, again, another wonderful resource of information for the Steinberg community. Um, just one quick question, I uh, just one quick point. Uh, you know, last week I was on vacation and I leave for the NAM show tomorrow, so... I will be at the NAM show and have and be involved with meetings. So our next live stream will be a week from this upcoming Friday. I believe it's maybe the twenty first. Um, so just want to give people a heads up. So there won't be a live stream this Friday as I'll be at the NAM show. And if anyone is coming to the NAM show, please stop by the Omaha booth and say hello. And next Tuesday, I'll be traveling with some of my uh, colleagues from Steinberg doing. Uh, studio and composer visits. Um, so I'll be kind of tied up in meetings that day. So look for the next live stream a week from this Friday. Uh, the week after that, I have um, other corporate meetings I have to be traveling for. I'm going to see if I could, see if I have time to do live streams while I'm in the hotel. Uh, but we'll uh, keep you informed of that. And then when we get into May, everything should be back to our normal Tuesday and Friday schedule. All right, so with that, we will go ahead and begin. Um, so first question, um, how to export large orchestral projects without having cracks or instruments uh, falling out, or I guess it's pedals reacting weird, bouncing into audio, I was told, how, how to do this and why. So a lot of times what can happen if you have a large kind of orchestral work uh, as you're working on it, so say we have something like this. And if at the point, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with large sample libraries, you have multiple sample libraries going on, that could take a lot of not only your computer's processing power, but can also um, use a lot of your computer's memory. So what some people will do is when you, you know, why we export it as audio is one that you, this way, if, when exporting it as an audio file, People could listen to it who, you know, don't have a DAW with the same orchestral plugins. Um, so it's just an audio file that can be freely distributed so that people can hear your work. Now, how we export the files is just by going to your file menu, and then we say export audio mix down. And we could choose to have this be a multi-export where if we wanted to export audio files of each individual instrument. Um, so if that is required where you want it, <clears throat> perhaps the oboe, the uh, bassoon, the flute, 
Horn one and two, the strings all to be as individual files. You could do that, or we could just choose to do a single file, <clears throat> and we could just choose to do our export directly here. So we'll say we want to export the stereo out. We want to give it a name. We could choose a file path of where the file will be saved to, and then all you would need to do at that point is just to click on export audio and that would create an audio file. We could choose your format. So if you want it to be an MP3 or wave, the sample rate and bit depth, and then you could export so that you could freely share your project with other people who can hear it without them necessarily having to have the same exact sample libraries that you do. All right. All right. All right, so we see from Braxel says, I did not think uh, they were doing live streams this week with Nam. I guess I'm wrong. So I'm flying out tomorrow. Uh, so um, that's why we're doing it today. So we usually do it on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, so that's why we wanted to make sure we can get a particular um, live stream in this week. So, all right, so we see Gerald Ely is sending greetings from sunny California. He's on a golf course today, and he'll check the stream afterwards and just welcome me back for my uh, vacation. Thank you very much. All right, and Heartbreak Time Machine says it's amazing in California today. Okay, Braxel asks, uh, it, it appears that Cubase 12 uses your graphics card. Is that true? Uh, if it is true, what is the best way to set it up so it is not hogging my computer resources? So obviously, any program that you know is outputting to a monitor is going to be using your graphics card. When working with graphics cards, a lot of them may have kind of uh, souped up performance for gaming needs and gaming requirements. Um, and that could often interrupt real-time audio performance. So generally, if you're going to be, and, and a lot of people run into this with like NVIDIA, which is probably the most popular graphics driver, uh, graphics you know, company, uh, is probably just to run a basic, uh, just to install the basic drivers and control panel and not to install like the enhanced gaming options. So Cubase doesn't really utilize the, you know, the GPU for processing. There's a company called GPU Audio and some other companies which are working on hosting plugins off of the GPU from your graphics card. So that's something, uh, but that would be particular to plugins. But, you know, any program that's outputting, you know, to a monitor will be utilizing your graphics card. But generally just use like the most basic settings that you can and that will um that will probably give you the best results so it's not interrupting and in, uh your audio performance wonderful to see jazz dude on and one other thing if you're watching if you're attending live i'm presenting from uh alexandria virginia and just let us know where you live and who you are Okay, so we see uh, from K.O. Williams, uh, I have both instrument tracks record enabled at the same time with virtual instruments on different MIDI channels, but for some reason the signals overlapping and playing in unison and, unison and not independently. Okay. Okay, so when we go to play, so let's say if I have my uh, oboe and let's say a cello, so I'll come here and we'll see if so as we would play. Just, uh, sorry. So, say if we do. All 
and let's 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 uh, just do our flute and oboe here. So, and let me I'll just set up my flute. All right, so now we hear. So if they're both kind of recorded and abled, um, if we have the MIDI input set to all MIDI inputs, the MIDI will be going to both of the channels. So let's say if I'm here and we just put this into record. So now I, when I play. So, you know, the actual MIDI channel, you know, is coming from your controller, but if you have both of these on particular, uh, you know, if you have one controller and they're both enabled, they'll record the same data. Uh, if you want it, your controller to be split, what you could do if you want it only, if your MIDI controller is transmitting on certain channels within certain zones, we could go to the input transformer and let's go to our track and it will open up the panel. And at this point we could filter channels and there'll be factory presets for channel filtering. So we could say we want to have this one only pass channel one on this particular track. Uh, so this would be channel one and I wanted this channel to only be when we uh, go to our input transformer for this particular channel, we can say, I want to activate it. We'll go to our factory presets and let's go to our channel filtering. And I only want this to be on channel two. So this way we could um, filter out particular channels if needed, but generally Cubase will take whatever incoming MIDI information is going to particular tracks and will take, you know, it doesn't channelize the MIDI information unless you use the input transformer. Now, if you wanted two separate controllers to be used where like I wanted one keyboard to play flute and one to play oboe, at that point, we would just, instead of selecting all MIDI inputs as the input source, what we want to do is to select, I want you know this controller for this channel and a different controller for this track. And then you could specify particular controllers for each, for each instrument if needed. All right, wonderful to see Rick Ballantyne on. All right, and Rick's question is, and Rick's a wonderful composer based out of uh, Charlotte area. Um, is it possible yet to name lanes? All right, so let's go ahead and I'll switch to project. So let's come over here and So if you're not familiar with lanes, we'll show you how, what they do. Okay, so I'm gonna put this audio track into record. And we'll just do some lanes here. So we're gonna put it into a cycle record. And we'll open up our lanes so we could see these. All right, so generally, you know, the name can be derived from uh, the audio file that we do. Um, so, you know, and this is in fact kind of one recording. Now, one of the tricks that you could do if you wanted to name these independently is to select the lanes, right click and say, um, we could say create tracks from lanes. And now each of these can be loaded up as different tracks. Uh, and these tracks we can label as we see fit, just like that. But since the lanes are kind of a subset of <clears throat> the particular track, 
they don't get independent names because you know this is actually well it looks like it's uh, five different audio files it's actually one contiguous audio file so and then the name would be derived directly from the track itself but again you could just go to your lanes uh, right click and say create tracks from lanes and then you could rename if necessary great to see you on the live stream Rick I hope you're well All right, so we have Jan in Stockholm joining. We see Benny checking in from Sweden. All right, we have Andreas Mullen, Mullen checking in from Belgium. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Drazi Eternal. Um, hey, Greg, howdy. Uh, here's a question. When I'm generating harmony vocals, do I change the octave on chord, ta on chord track so that the harmony voices won't be so deep? So what you could do is, you know, as you do harmonies, um, so let, let's say if I was, let me just go to a particular. Just find something to do harmonies on quickly. Let me just look for. Okay, so I'm going to just take my piano part and drag it to my chords. And now I want to, so now that I've done that, I want to create harmony. So let's say if we go to set up voicing and let's just say we want to only use uh, triads and we could set the lowest note range here. I think that now that we do this, that that will affect kind of our harmony voices. Um, but so I'm gonna come to my audio menu. So I'm gonna select just a little bit of. So we know what the chords are for this. So I'm gonna go to my audio and to generate harmony voices. So, and let's say I just want to do two harmony voices. All right, so now. So now that we look at these within our very audio editor, so I'll just say this edit. And we'll just get to our very audio so we could see we can see that the harmonies will be tight. So try just on the chord track itself. Um, you'll see setup voicing, try just to use triads and then you could just simply come over there. So if you choose four note chords, you may have lower harmonies being generated. So try just choosing triads and I think that will affect the chords that are being, uh, the harmonies that are being generated for you. All right, so Dallas LaRue asks a question. Uh, I'm bringing in samples that we ha that have bass and guitars combined. Is there any way with EQ that I could get further separation for the bass or dissolve it to MIDI to put it on its own track? Um, probably the best thing that you could do if you have like bass and, gu and guitars combined. Um, let's come over here. Um, is, you know, so doing EQ won't necessarily, you know, depending on the voicing of it, um, you might be able to separate it. But one of the things that you could do, the best approach would be to, if you have Spectral Layers Pro, is just kind of go into Spectral Layers. And now uh, as we go to Spectral Layers, we can just come over 
and it's now kind of doing it's loading up this whole file into spectral layers and at this point if you have the spectral layers pro you could just choose to unmix stems and then here you could just say okay i want to do uh like base and other and then you could you could separate the stems here so that you could just at this point um you know separate the stems so you might be able to do do it through eq but uh you know if they're kind of matching um you know you might be able to get it with eq but i, I don't think it'll get you what it may not get you to the level of separation that you want. So I think you're using Spectral Layers Pro. Uh, and if you don't have the, you have a Spectral Layers 1 that comes with Cubase 11 and Cubase 12 Pro. Uh, and you could check out like, it, you know, and that will allow you to unmix voices. But, you know, try out the, you could do a trial version of Spectral Layers Pro and use that to separate. And I think that's a wonderful uh, tool to use for many other types of tasks like that. All right, wonderful to see Daniela Tokan on. All right, and wishing everyone happy Easter. All right, Parabot2 asks, uh, hi Greg, is there a way to get a MIDI drum pattern onto separate tracks, kick, snare, etc., all separate using Groove Agent, using Cubase 12 Pro? Okay, so let's jump to a different project here. All right, so the trick is if you want to separate all of your drums, I'm going to come over to this and let's say I have my pattern and I'm just wanting to take this particular pattern and I wanted to separate each of the different sounds to their own, uh, to their own track. What we could do is go to MIDI and you'll see dissolve part. And here we'll choose separate pitches. We'll hit process. And now each of my different sounds will be isolated onto their own tracks. So this way we could just go over here. We can see this is kick. This will be our hi-hat closed, bongo three. So every time we do this, so once again, just go to MIDI to uh, dissolve part. So once you have the event selected here, so again, MIDI to dissolve part and choose to separate pitches. And then each of them will automatically be loaded into their own separate track. All right, so Heartbreak Time Machine is sending greetings from Sacramento. All right, we have uh, Christian McConnell says he's happily here from London, Ontario, Canada. Thanks for joining us. All right, so John Costigan asks, uh, Greg, uh, could you remind me about the best practice in free warping a six part harmony in the in place editor? I sang them a bit sloppily, but the pitches are close. All right, so let me say, I think okay, I have something we might be able to use. All right, let me go to this project here. So if it was just like maybe a little bit rhythmically sloppy, um, I would consider trying the auto alignment. And there's an audio alignment function that we'll show here. So, okay, so as we listen to this, Somos iguales. Somos iguales. so say, you know, rhythmically, it's looking a little off. Uh, so what one thing, one approach to do, what I would try first, John, is to select an event that you think it has like reasonably good timing that you want to use. And then you could click on right here. 
and you open up the audio alignment and I'm going to set one as the reference. So I'm going to select this file as the reference. And then I'm going to take the other files here as targets and we could choose where you want to match words or prefer time shifting. So I, I usually have those checked and you could vary the percentage. And we'll just say align audio. So now when we listen to it. So that could tighten up like background vocals that are a little bit out. Now, if you still want it before doing that, if you wanted to do it manually, uh, all you would have to do is I would select the event. Um, let's go to... You know, as we record audio in, um, it's going to automatically create hit points for you. So if we go to real-time processing, I'll say let's create warp markers from hit points. And then we could do this one at a time. I'm going to go to my warp tool, and we're going to choose free warp. And if you don't see some of the different elements here, uh, what you could do now is just say, okay, I want that part to start here, and I want that to go directly here. So you could click to add a warp marker and then you could just say, okay, I want to take the warp marker for this and just manually move and align it visually to what's going on. But I would always try the audio alignment first. Uh, it's like a great tool for background vocals as you probably just heard cleaning up those elements. All right, so we have uh, Balsa checking in from Montenegro. So thanks for being on today. All right, so we see Jean-Marie Horvath. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll get in touch with you and because um, I'll be traveling with some of the Germans. I'm sure they would love to meet up with you. But if you're going to be at NAMM, uh, I'd love to go hear your Atmos mixes. Look forward to seeing you at NAMM. All right, so we see from Alessandro Braz asks, uh, how do you make this sampler in Cubase monophonic, one voice only? Okay, so I'm going to just come over here. Let's just grab file and I'll create a sampler track from this event. Um, All right, so I think if we, let's see if there's, I think there's a way of doing it to just have it be monophonic mode. So if I try to play chords, like you see on the keyboard here, like when I play the chords. So you know I'm playing chords, so just click right here and that will put you into monophonic mode. So now you can... So now I'm not playing chords, just playing one pitch at a time. So if I take this off, now I play chord. And then we could just enable audio warp here quickly. But now, once monophonic mode is turned on, turn it off, play the same chords. So, give that a try. All right, so we see Taxi Williams Music says uh, he'll be at Dam, and we'll definitely stop by. So, I'll be in the Yamaha booth. I'll be kind of not 
have an official Steinberg booth, but I'll be there, so please stop by. It'd be wonderful to see everyone that makes it out to the show. All right, so we have a question from uh, Sounds Like Matt. Uh, hey, I'm wondering whether there's any roadmap toward polyphonic tuning for very audio. Uh, would love a solution for out of tune guitar chords without buying Melodyne. Um, so a lot of times what you could do, um, I know what a lot of people end up doing is just, you know, so nothing has been announced for kind of a polyphonic very audio, um, but a lot of people will use spectral layers and be able to kind of select particular notes with all of the harmonics and be able to adjust, but nothing that's been um, nothing that's been like announced yet. All right, so we have Craig Nobles checking in from West Virginia, so the state just right next to me. Thanks for being on the live stream. All right, so we see, uh, hi, Greg, what is the easiest way, question, uh, what is the easiest way to select multiple events with different start positions and trim them to the same start position? Okay, so let's say I have events here. Okay, so if you want to... Uh, take these events and move them to the cursor. You know, I think if we go to, uh, there is a move function. I think this works on not for multiple events. Uh, so let's say if we go to edit and we say move to cursor, I think the first one will move to the cursor position. Uh, but if we want it to move the start of all of the events to the cursor, I think we could do it in the project logical editor. So let's say we'll get a setup and we'll say media type, um, we'll say container type is events and that the property is that the event is selected and we want to go to position and we'll set we'll say move to cursor so now all these events will move all the selected events Oops. Where is. so now all these events should move to the cursor position so try utilizing uh, the project logical editor. I'll just save this as a preset. So give that a try. Let me know how that works for you. Uh, so we see maybe a clarification or follow-up point from Andreas. Uh, I think this is with the export says yes, but sometimes uh, there are those problems in my individual audio exports. So sometimes it could be, you know, one of the things that you might want to try to do as you're exporting. So some instruments are more problematic when exporting and rendering files than others. Um, but also try raising the buffer on your audio interface. So if you're running into problems when you're doing like a big export, you know, try to go to your audio interface and go to the control panel and try just raising the buffer. And that may give you some extra headroom to work with. So maybe try raising your buffer, Andreas, and let me know how that works. All right, uh, so we have a question. Um, I have a sustain pedal attached to my controller and for some reason it also transmits 
uh, CC for portamento on off. Um, is there a workaround in a logical editor to get rid of that unwanted CC without having to make that adjustment every time I open a Cubase project? So the first thing I would do, I don't think I have my sustain pedal connected. No, oh, maybe I do. Um, so I have my sustain pedal connected. So what I would do first is, let's say we add an instrument track. All right, so make sure that your controller isn't spitting out that particular message. So what we could do is go to the MIDI inserts and let's go to MIDI monitor. So I want to just go to the MIDI monitor right here and then when you hit the controller, make sure that it's actually spitting out controller 64. Okay, so I'm just hitting my sustain pedal and I see that I hit and I release my sustain pedal. So if you notice that this is transmitting portamento, um, it's being done probably in your MIDI controller itself. So, and, and if th that's the case, Cubase is capturing what your MIDI controller is transmitting. Um, so if you wanted to get rid of all portamento, you know, what you can do is just go to the logical editor and let me just select Just come over here and we'll just, so we'll give it some MIDI notes. Let's go to the logical editor and you could choose to, you know, if you wanted to transform uh, notes, we'll say controller 64. So we'll say value one. So we'll just say 64. <clears throat> and then what you could do, whatever portamento is, I don't know, I forgot what MIDI CC it is, but we'll go to value one and we could subtract. And let's just say when I come here, so let's say if portamento was uh, controller 50, just blanking on, is it maybe eight or something like that? So you can say, okay, I want to take controller 64 <clears throat> and I want to turn it into <clears throat> controller eight. What I could do, I'll remove this and we'll say we want to subtract 56. I'm going to clear my throat, hang on. And then we could take any of those messages and subtract it. But I think the first, you know, the first thing I would do is just make sure that, you know, once you come here that it's actually transmitting the MIDI CC. It's probably best to fix it in the controller if that's transmitting the wrong CC message. All right, Braxel asks, um, <clears throat> trying to understand why I get so many pops and clicks in Cubase 12 Pro when I use neural DSP plugins, such as Soldano, SLO, Slow 100. I mess with the buffer, but I like to understand more. Um, so sometimes it could be, you know, particular plugins may not interact well with particular graphics cards. Graphics cards are kind of notorious for this. Um, you know, see if... You know, as you know, one of the thing, the first thing to do is to you know play with the buffer size. Okay, let me just. <clears throat> okay, so it could be that you know you might have to increase the buffer size, and when you increase the buffer size, that could be more latency on the particular track. So when you come over here, let's get to the control panel. You know, if you're running at a super low buffer, perhaps raise the buffer and that may you know, give you more uh, more headroom to work with. Um, one of the things that you could also do is just to make sure that once you're in your audio mix down, that you have ASIO guard activated and that could just run that one particular track 
at, uh, that is recording at a lower latency and the other plugins can be running, other tracks can be running at higher latencies. Um, so make sure that you're running as you guard, that you have multi-processing activated and you realize that you know, some of the more complex plugins can take more CPU cycles to do their magic. Um, and I know that the Neural DSP is pretty sophisticated for their guitar amp simulations and it might just take more CPU than what you have. Uh, and one other thing to do is if you're running other plugins, like if you're running into something like a big mastering chain on your master fader, you know, try to disable some of the plugins that you're not using right at that time to see if that could uh, free up some additional system resources for you. All right, so sounds like Matt asks, uh, is there a way to assign control room monitoring volume up and down to my keyboard? Um, so I'm not sure if it's a keyboard shortcut that you want to do or using like a MIDI remote. Um, so if you're doing it for like a MIDI remote, that's and if you have like a fader on your keyboard, I will come over here to my MIDI remote and let's say I just want to take this particular uh, slider right here. So I'm going to just double click here and I'm just going to right click and we'll say set up for MIDI remote mapping. I move the fader, hit apply. And now I could control my volume just right there from my MIDI keyboard. If it's a computer keyboard like if you want a keyboard shortcut to increment and de decrement volume I don't think that there is one for uh, the volume control in the control room I'll just take a look just to make sure but let's just confirm Yeah, so I don't see one, um, but again, you know, anything that's set up in the MIDI remote, just right click, pick up for MIDI remote mapping, move the slider, and then just click apply mapping and close, and then you're controlling your control room volume just that easily. Sorry, my chat just jumped to me. All right, so I think I'm... All right, so a question. Uh, hey, Greg, uh, is there a way in Cubase Pro 11 to map an expression pedal to a VST that doesn't respond to it automatically, i.e. contact instrument? I know it's possible within contact, but not easily. Um, um, so I'm not, sh yeah, I don't have a license of contact on this computer. Um, so if you want your expression pedal to map to something else. So let's say I want to take my modulation. Uh, so let's say I get to my MIDI monitor and I'll open this up. So let's say I have modulation here. So I want my modulation to turn into, let's say, expression. Okay, so again, we'll come over to our input transformer and let's go to our track and let's open up the panel. So we'll say, okay, I want to take, um, so we want to transform, and we're gonna say, I want to transform uh, type is equal to controller. And we're gonna say our value of our controller is one. So this is gonna take MIDI CC one data. And let's say I wanted to turn it into uh, expression. So I'm gonna say, let's go to, so we have, MIDI channel, we have MIDI CC1. In your case, it may be CC11 if you want to take your expression. 
And let's say I'm going to add 10. So let's say you want to go from 11 to 1, you would subtract 10. Um, so now, as soon as I activate the input transformer here, and we look at the, my, the MIDI monitor, I'll turn this on. It's MIDI CC 11. So let's go to my input transformer. Let me just, I will put this as always on top. So we have MIDI CC. So my modulation wheel is now created to a different. And if I turn this off, it's back to CC1. So you could use the input transformer to remap different controllers. Uh, and then you could remap it to a controller that's automatically uh, going to work with your contact instrument, you know, depending on the instrument. So you can remap any controller to any other controller. All right, so we see a uh, question from Kerry Dixon. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, Vancouver, powerful PC, Wave servers, USB 3 uh, is not helpful on Windows 10. Uh, Thunderbolt 3 Apollo, is there any USB 3 options to decrease latency? So I know like the, um, you know, not every USB chipset can really take, you know, some USB 3 chipsets can take advantage of, I think it's called super speed. Uh, transmission so I know like the Steinberg URC can run with like a super speed transmission speed on USB 3 or it could run under USB 2 if you're uh, you know depending on your USB chipset but there is a you know it is more responsive and will decrease latency if your uh, actual system supports that so it could depend on the USB ports on your computer and if you connect it to um, some of the USB ports, maybe functioning as a hub, and some may be directly connected to the motherboard. And sometimes the ones connected directly to the motherboard can be uh, can run faster. But there are a number. I know that the Steinberg URC and AXR4U interfaces they'll take it. They'll they will increase and be more responsive and have lower latency under USB three than USB two. But with the correct uh, chipset on a USB. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, sometimes I record audio, and the last layer seems to be to desaper before I'm able to play it and listen. Is there a setting that could be wrong? Also, the general uh, serving seemed to say maximum 10 takes. Okay. All right, so I'll just go ahead and just do a quick. So I don't think that there's a maximum on takes, but let me just come here and we'll just do quick record enable. All right, so... Um, All right, so I'll just do a number of different takes here. All right, so here we could see 22 different takes. So I don't think there's a maximum on takes that you have. Um, So I just see sometimes record audio. The last layer seems to be seems to desaper before I, I'm able to play it and listen. Uh, is there a setting that could be wrong? Also, the general setting seems to be maximum of ten takes. So let me know if I did something differently. So this is just when I stopped recording. But if we wanted to look at all the lanes, um, we could see. Uh, what it you know say so here because we haven't recorded a full pass is why we see the information from the previous take automatically kind of carried over but let me know if I'm doing something differently than you are I see Daniela says she likes that I'm using a 
classic orchestral set. So. All right, so we see from K.O. Williams, kind of a follow-up, um, says, yes, Greg, uh, that the issue, both instruments play together and they should be separate since they are on different MIDI channels. <clears throat> so if you're recording, <clears throat> you know, the MIDI channels aren't going to be channelized uh, on input unless you go into the input transformer. So that way you could have one MIDI controller that could be written to multiple channels. But again, if you want to get to the point where only, you know, the particular, um, where you wanted to channelize the MIDI, all you'd have to do is just come here and say, okay, on your controller, if you're transmitting to, you know, controller one, MIDI channel one is going to the input transformer and just saying track. And once we go to open the panel, that, you know, we could just pass do the channel filtering and this will pass only that one particular MIDI channel. But MIDI, many MIDI controllers just tr don't transmit the MIDI channel per se. Um, but if we have two different tracks selected, you know, we could record from one single controller to both of them. And that's how it is. <clears throat> that's how it's designed to use unless you utilize the input transformer to channelize it. So if I wanted to record on, you know, all four of these tracks while I'm playing, um, I could just hit record. And that will record the same data to all of the tracks. So it's it's channelized on playback by default. And if you want to channelize it on input, again, go to your input transformer and look and there's presets specifically for this as well. So that way you could have one MIDI controller and record on multiple parts simultaneously. All right, um, so you just see Carrie Dixon's is saying, uh, do VSTI affecting my clocking with Waves plugins slash servers as using a combo of VSTs native to Cubase and Waves ill? Um, so I don't think, um, I, I, I don't have any Waves servers or Waves plugins, but I haven't heard of any issues with it. So I don't think you would have any clocking issues um, with that. So if, if you're talking about kind of audio clock, that should all be handled kind of in the VST domain uh, inside of the audio engine of Cubase. All right, so we have a question from Sounds Like Matt. Um, is cut head slash cut tail only available in key commands for the newest versions? I'm on 10.5 and don't see it. <clears throat> Let's take a look. Um, I don't have 10.5 installed, but we can show you maybe where it's at. So look under edit and you'll see cut head, cut tail. <clears throat> I believe that that would be in the same place. Uh, I believe that came in in version maybe 9.5 or 10. <clears throat> maybe 9 or 9.5. So look under edit, uh, cut head and cut tail and see if you see it there. Um, if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I could be happy to take a look at it. On uh, I have 10.5 on my personal computer still. I'd be happy to take a look at it. But try looking under the edit section. All right, uh, so we see from Balsa asks, uh, hi Greg, uh, drawing MIDI piano chords, the velocities are the same throughout. Is there a way to select notes and randomize the velocity of each note in a chord for a more natural feel? Okay, so there is um, an insert velocity. So let's say if we wanted to 
draw in chords and uh, so let's come over here to the settings and so there's going to be a insert velocity this may not be turned on by default so go to the settings here and you could say okay let's insert velocity and then once we do this we could see that we're going to have four different velocity values these can be changed to your liking so we have uh, you know, level one being 100 by default, level two, level three, level four, level five. Um, so once we have this done, uh, we could go to key commands. Okay, so we'll say insert velocity one, two, three, four. So I'm gonna go to my MIDI remote and let's just go and I'll remap one of these. So we'll just come. All right, so I want this to be and I'll just say let's get to insert velocity. Okay, so I'll just say, let's insert velocity. I'll just do two on this particular button. Insert velocity three on the next button. So now as I go to enter in notes in the editor, I hit this button and now we can see that my velocity will be 90. I hit another button, it'll be 70. I hit my third button, it'll be 50. And then 125. So you could set up different keyboard shortcuts or a generic remote to enter in different velocity values as we just draw in. So if you want some natural human, essence and as we come to the insert velocities you could set your own velocity values if you know which particular velocities work for particular instruments and where you may switch between different sample layers based on velocity so try going to the setup and go to insert velocity make sure that that's visible and then once you have the insert velocity you could assign either a key command for it so look for the insert velocity or use kind of the MIDI remote to have just buttons that will just insert the particular velocities very easily. All right, so a question. Uh, hey, Greg, I want to perform live with Cubase, adding guitar and vocal with various effects so I can mangle my voice live. Any tips on how to create a program changes to a VST for guitar sound and vocal? Um, so a lot of times, you know, if it's going, if the, if the instrument, if the plugin will respond to program changes so a lot of times you know, there could be a lot of plugins that don't do this and it's not that it's not possible but the plugins don't implement it so if you have like a guitar plugin um you know you could just choose to automate a particular uh plugin so let's say if i have um let me just go to a different project to show this Okay, so let's say at this point I have uh, my guitar plugin. So instead of sending a program change, you know, you should be able to just, you know, automate the particular parameters. Let's say we're in the VST amp rack. Um, and let's say we'll start off with this and I'll just automate the plugin. So let's say at this point I want to go to. these 
parameters and let's change this. All right. And so you can see that you could automate kind of the different knobs. As we go along, so you know, instead of you know, what you can do if you have like particular plugins that do respond to program changes, is that you could add a MIDI track to it, and then often you'll see like the MIDI output port going to uh, a particular MIDI plugin if it's going to respond to that and just send a program change on this MIDI track or just simply, you know, if you know that at this time you want, you know, this particular, uh, you know, guitar amp preset, you know, just automate programming, you know, say, okay, I want to go to that amp. So let's say on this particular track, And even if you wanted to just switch using like a MIDI remote, you know, you could switch between kind of different guitar amps using the MIDI remote. So if you say, okay, I want that to switch to that amp model, this amp model switched from this particular button. So let's apply the mapping. So now as you play, you could use the MIDI remote to just kind of toggle back and forth between different parameters and settings. So I would probably just automate all of the different plugins. A lot of people will have each song kind of laid out for you. So you, and then you could, you know, have everything kind of pre-configured live for you. All right, wonderful to see Soren from Sweden. See Lawrence Koch just ask, uh, just saying hello from Rhode Island. Just wishing I had a great vacation, had a wonderful time in on vacation. All right, and we have uh, Jacques Herb, Herb uh, just wishing everyone greetings, sending everyone greetings from Holland. Thanks for being on there on the live stream. All right, we have Harry Olive on as well. All right, and we have Brian Brian Sawyer. Senior, it's a, great to see you on as well. All right, influential uh, Gurning asks, what are the prized new bits of Cubase 12? So there's probably about, um, there's probably over 100 new features. So there's going to be uh, new plugins. You're going to have FX modulator for kind of doing like creative LFO types of effects. You're going to have uh, it's running on a new licensing system, so you no longer need a USB E licensor. You have the new MIDI remote, so you could easily uh, map different parameters. It's going to be Apple M1 native. Um, so lots and lots. You know, we actually, if you just search for one of the live streams, um, if you look for like around March, maybe been like March 5th. Of 2022, we did almost a two-hour walkthrough of all of the new features. Lots of editing, free warping on the project window, so lots of great stuff. Um, automatic uh, chord detection from audio. So uh, new, I, th I think Razor was introduced in version 12. Kind of a new limiter plugin. So. Okay, so we see Sven Isaacson ask, uh, Wavelab Pro, is there a way to normalize several files, a full album, in such a way that the level relationships of the individual files aren't disturbed, i.e. raise, lower all files in one go? So it generally, it's not going to normalize. could set it to a similar value, but I think we could do it, uh, you know, take all the files in a montage and increase the gain. So let's just come and say okay let's get to wave lab quickly
All right, so let's say if you want to raise and lower, you know, so if you wanted to just come over here, um, let's see if we could do this multiply. Just see if there's, there's often we do this in more of the So we see, um, so here we could just say match uh, specific loudness. So if you wanted to um, do that, so and you know, so we could take them all to match a specific loudness. But generally, what a lot of people can do in like, you know, you could do it in the batch processor as well so if you wanted to do like a new batch process um so we could just say i wanted to you know increase i wanted to take all of these files and at this point we could just say okay i wanted to add a template so let's just say Um, I wanted to, you know, go to specific volumes, but a lot of times in the, when we go into the particular, uh, you know, montage, you know, we could just, you know, the normalizing we could think of as primarily, you know, to have consistent levels and not necessarily raise the levels all. So let's just say, just come back over here to edit. So here, that's just kind of rendered it. Let me just see if we get un. So you know you could you could raise them all by doing a batch process, and you know, but generally in you know at the point is. You know, if you wanted to do multiple files at once is maybe just to take, you know, the individual tracks here and raise them. Um, and that would allow you to, um, you know, to treat it as, you know, as individual files. Uh, or you could just choose to we just open up. Project one more time. See if this project is in here, real quick. Start to file. Let me just close out real quick.
All right, so let's see if we select. So it looks like it's kind of done individually here. Um, but a lot of times, you know, if you get into you know, the meta normalizer, so let's say we get a process. Let's see if there's just a way of raising it here. So generally this would, you'd want it to be kind of more consistent. But you could match to specific loudness or equalize peak levels and So I think you might have to just, you know, go to edit the individual ones. Um, or let me just. Yes, it looks like those are kind of doing it that way in the montage. Uh, but you could always just do it in the batch processor. But I'll play around with it, Sven, if you want to email me as well. Maybe I'll come up with a better workflow for that. All right, so we have a question. Um, will there be significant performance impact from keeping my Cubase projects on external USB drives rather than drives plugged straight into my motherboard? Um, so, you know, it, it depends if, you know, the ones that are plugged straight into your motherboard could be faster, um, but it could be that, you know, while they're faster that, you know, if you're doing a thousand tracks, you may notice it, but, you know, like 400 tracks of audio playing back, you may notice if it's like 30 tracks, that you may not notice it at all. I know people uh, went through a whole project with someone that ended up running the entire mix from a, like a USB flash drive and didn't realize it. So, um, but, but generally it could free up some of your CPU resources, but you could try it out on your particular system and you may see that it may not make a huge difference often like drive speed, unless you're doing lots of, you know, like you may notice it more if you were doing lots of orchestral samples, uh, where, you know, you're accessing thousands, tens of thousands of samples at once, but for playing back audio you may not notice a huge difference. All right, wonderful to see John Barry and Patrick Emmanuel A. Patrick is happy to be on live. See, Drys Eternal says, thanks to Harmony Voice, answer was perfect. All right, so we have Parabot 2. Uh, hi, Greg, can you show how to set up MIDI channel and output in a Cubase track to contact? I don't have contact on, uh, but all you'd have to do is just come right over here and say you want to add an instrument track. I'll use something like Howling in 7, which would be similar. So I'll add a Howling in 7 instance. We'll add it as an instrument track. So we see that this is added, and now I could choose uh, if it's going, you know, we can see that it's going out to Howling in 7, and I could just set my MIDI channel right here. So that's all you have to do is just kind of add. And if you say, okay, you want it to, within the same instance of contact, let's say we have a multi-instrument uh, that you wanted to add, like sounds on a different, MIDI channel, all you do then is select the instrument track. And then if you add a MIDI track, at that point, it's automatically gonna be routed to the same instrument. So if you have the instrument selected, you can now add a MIDI track that will be, that MIDI track will carry over 
the same MIDI port as well as increment the channel. So this would be channel one, channel two. If I add another instrument, if I add another MIDI track at that point, it'll be Halion 7, port A, um, you know, MIDI channel three. So you could just, you know, as you add MIDI tracks, that will increment the channels. So let me know if that makes sense. All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, is there a shortcut to put all instruments on purge all samples? Um, so it's really up to the instrument and how it handles it. So ever, you know, some instruments don't have that capability. You know, some like Halion, Halion Sonic do. Uh, so you could just come over here and, you know, do, you know, get rid of an unload to unused samples, but there isn't a command inside of Cubase because a lot of instruments don't support that. And it's really up to the instrument itself to, for that particular function. Okay, so we have a question. Um, my volume faders for plugins or any track moves, uh, usually down to infinite, automatically without automation set on a track. What could be the reason? All right, so it, if you're adding, let's say, an instrument rack, so let's come over here and I'll say I'm going to add a rack instrument. So let's say, okay, I'm going to add a pad shop. And we do that. Um, so we add to pad shop instance and we look at our mix console and as we slide over, if we add kind of like a MIDI track in of itself, uh, we'll see that um, as we add our pad shop um, that the, you know, we could have the MIDI volume automatically be at zero and many people would prefer to do the automation uh, on the actual effect return channel. So they would do the automation here as opposed to MIDI volume. So it could be that the MIDI volume is set to zero and will stay there. And then it will kind of prompt you to actually do the automation on the virtual instrument itself. So you may see that you'll have an instance of pad shop where as soon as you add it, that the pad shop volume is automatically down and that's MIDI CC7. And if it's a virtual instrument, the audio output of the virtual instrument can be controlled in the VST audio domain as opposed to, so if it's automatically down, make sure it's not an instrument that's going to, a MIDI track that's going to an instrument in the rack. All right, so we have uh, RG checking in from Poland. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, so we see uh, Devin Dennis says, uh, from Connecticut says, I've noticed a bug in Groove Agent 5 SE. When I replace an instrument on a pad, I can no longer use the MIDI controller modulation to modify the pitch. Okay, so let's take a look. So we'll open up. And all right, so I'm going to just come over here to pitch and we'll learn CC. So I'm moving my modulation wheel. All right, so I'm going to drag a new sample onto there.
All right. So I'm just going to clear the sample. Just cut the pad. So still the same MIDI CC. And now it's still controlling the pitch. So let me know, let me, I'll just reread it. Um, it says when I replace an instrument on a pad, I can no longer use the MIDI controller modulation to modify the pitch. So it seemed like that was working kind of as expected. So let's say if I come here to the pad and again, learn CC for a pitch and then replace that. So let me know if I'm doing something differently than you are, Devin. All right. Um, so how well would the spectral layer separate stems work for vocal and guitar? I'd love to be able to tune vocals with very audio from an acoustic performance. So it works probably better than it should, but let me see if I could create a situation. I'm not sure if I have just a vocal and guitar mix, but I could create one. So let me just... All right, so I'll just do a small portion here. And I'll just put this into, we'll create a new project, create a new audio track. All right, so let's say this is gonna be our All right, let me just do that again because I had this one chord enabled. All right, so we have just vocal and guitar there. So let's go to our layers. And we'll go to spectral layers, to our extensions. So now we're separating. All right, so let's go ahead and say we'll play this. So you can do a lot of different vocal tuning and all you have to do at this point is just drag uh, the vocal out and then you could just, do, you know, if you wanted to at this point get audio to bounce 
selection. So we'll just say um, then once you come over here, you could just go right, right into your very audio and do all of your tuning work independently. Okay, uh, so we see uh, Greg, I've gotten from Soren, asks, um, I've gotten Stream Deck to work with Loop MIDI and Cubase Pro on my PC. Now I want the generic remote copied over to my laptop. Uh, is that possible? How? So I think all the generic remote settings would be uh, included with um, the profile manager. Um, but if not, let's come over here. Let's add a quick generic remote. All right, so, and also you could just come over here, so go to your generic remote on your desktop and export it. Uh, and then you could just import it onto your laptop. So you could just email the XML file. So again, go to generic remote and export and then import. All right, so we have Arnold wishing everyone happy Easter from Germany. Hope everyone had a great holiday. All right, so we see Influential Gaming says, I find a quantize and grid editor a, a bit clunky though. Let me see if that is. Um, so let's say if, so if you want to look at the quantize editor, um, so let's say we'll go to our quantize function here. So let's say, you know, we could just choose your particular rhythmic value here. So you could choose, say I want to quantize to eighth notes, 16th notes. If we wanted to apply like a swing, we could apply like a swing feel directly to a particular preset. We could save that as a preset. Uh, so if you wanted this to be 16th note triplets, we could choose that as well. So you could see, um, and then once you're kind of working on the grids, we could choose to have the grids set to your bar to beat um, and or to use quantize. So, and as we zoom in here, we can see that now we could have our grid set to 16th note triplets or to half note triplets. So we could just kind of base our grid it could be based independently on bar or beat, which is pretty typical, or use the quantize preset. And then if you want to go to the quantize settings, you could just choose your particular quantize values right there. So let me know if that is makes sense. All right, we have Gus Gomez checking in from Pittsburgh. Thanks for being on. And Gus asks, uh, is any way to click in the area and play without click on top? without using shift and command. So if you wanted to play your particular project from anywhere, so let's say while it's playing is, you know, just click on, like all you'd have to do is just click on, like while it's playing, just the uh, alter option plus shift. Otherwise you would just select the event, if you're clicking on top of the event, there is a preference if you're clicking in empty area. So if you go to preferences, um, maybe under transport. So you could choose to um, locate when clicking in an empty space. So now anytime I'm in an empty space, but otherwise if you click here, 
you would select the event, which I think makes sense. Or if you just click with Alter Option plus Shift, you could click on the event without selecting it to move kind of the play position right there. So, uh, so if you want to click an empty space, but I think it makes sense that you know when you click that you could select an event first. Um, if you're selecting on an event and hold down the modifier keys to just go directly to that particular area. So while you're playing. And you could change, I think you could change the key command for that as well. So let's go to tool and modifiers and maybe we'll see if it's in the uh, select tool. set cursor position so you could switch that there as well so if you go to preferences to editing tool modifiers get to select tool um, you could put a different modifier in if you choose All right, so we have a question from the Heartbreak Time Machine. Um, uh, is it possible to add a location to the media bay so I don't have to manually search every time? So what you could do in the media bay is just come over. So let's say uh, if I'm in the media bay and I was like, okay, I really like this particular folder. So I'm going to go to File Browser. And let's say the this is like where all of my drum loops are so I'm gonna come over like I have my my secret snare stash so I'm gonna go to projects and so let's go to audio and you know and I wanted this particular folder here so let's say So I wanted these, so what I could do is just right click and add to favorites, and I'll just say snares. So now when I go back home, I could just go to favorites and then go right to snares. So we could just kind of set that up. And if you wanted to add a new folder in Media Bay, what you could do, so that way you won't have to manually search every time. Um, but if you wanted to just, if you're in Media Bay and you find that your folder isn't showing up, is just go to like my, you know, go to this computer and find your folder here. So let's say, okay, I want to go to projects and I want this, make sure that it's checked right here in Media Bay. And then you could also just kind of, if you have that checked and you don't see anything at this point, you could just say I'm looking for uh, particular audio files in this folder and then you could scan or add to favorites right there in Media Bay. So we see the Heartbreak Time Machine says he's tempted to get a plane ticket just to get a selfie with Greg. So yeah, lots of people kind of I think at one point, we, I, there was like six people lined up for pictures last year at NAMM show, but you could probably spend your money better ways. But if you do go to the show, please stop by. I'd love to meet you and say hi. All right, Influen influential, uh, is it gurning or gooming? Uh, what pres processors are most suited for QBay? So there's a lot of people... Um, on the Apple side, the M1 processor and M2 work really well on Apple platform, on Windows platform. Um, I would stay away from, you know, there's some of the later Intels have kind of, kind of a hybrid processor where they have a slow processor and a fast processor. Stay away from those uh, if you get just kind of like not a hybrid processor setup, but just a full on uh, processor that's not doing like two different speeds uh, or the, you know, the AMD Ryzen's, they're all kind of great choices. 
but I would try to, um, I would try to avoid maybe like the hybrid processors. It's kind of a, an odd thing. And it's not that Cubase doesn't work with it well. It's just that Windows doesn't work with it well. Okay, so we have a question. All right, so Michelle is saying hi. So thanks for joining us. Uh, Ali asked, I uh, wanted to ask if it's possible to select certain velocities in the MIDI part and copy only the velocity values and not the note actually. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, so let's say I have a velocity. Just kind of draw in some notes here. And this may seem counterintuitive at first, but let's say I'm just going to create um, just a quick velocity run here. So let me just. All right, so let's say I want that. Um, so what I could do is we open up a quantize preset. Um, and I'm going to just drag this over. All right, so at this point, uh, I'll just trim it. Let me trim it first here. Okay, so I'm going to drag this over. All right, so we see that we have position and velocity. Um, so let's say I have uh, my velocity is perfectly straight across or straight across here. Um, so what I could do is take the position and set that to 0% and take the velocity and set it to 100%. So um, let's see if I... Didn't mess it. All right, so now I'm going to come over and hit quantize. And now we could have that just the velocities, not the position, but just the velocities. So again, just come over and open up the quantize settings. And then we could set the velocity to 100% and position to 0%. So if we have my velocity like this, I could just say let's quantize based on that. So drag the event. So if I want this velocity change, drag it here. Again, set the position to zero velocity to 100. And let's say I have this. Now I quantize. And we could have that velocity pattern copied without affecting the position. So. Okay, so we have a question from Michelle. Uh, how to add my own drum kit to Beat Designer? Um, so Beat Designer will work with anything. So let's just, we'll start from scratch. So let's say we'll do new project. And I will add, let's say an instrument track. All right, so I'm just going to come over here and okay. And at this point, I'm going to choose to create the drum map from the instrument. So we could drag and drop any samples in. Let's go to the MIDI inserts and go to Beat Designer. And now we could have kind of all of our different drum sounds here. So let's say I want to kick one. And let's say snare, clap, hi-hat, and let's um, do shaker. And let's see if there's some percussion. All right, so let's say tambourine. So now at this point, as I hit play,
So really any, you know, whatever. So once you click here, you can select your MIDI pitch and then just be able to kind of draw in some different and be able to kind of program to anything. So it's whatever, you know, B Designer works with whatever instrument that instrument or MIDI track is being routed out to. All right, so uh, Carrie Dixon asks, um, using Motif XF uh, to use it as internal VSTI, do I need to use the FireWire card, not USB, but able not to use the audio card function? Use my Focusrite or Apollo sound card. So you don't have to use the internal audio on the Motif. So what you need to do once you have the Motif set up, you get to your audio connections and let's get to your external instruments. So we'll say, okay, let's say, okay, we're gonna have a Motif and whatever audio interface you're using, uh, at this point, you would just set up kind of where the outputs from the motif are connected into your Focusrite or into your Apollo interface. Um, and then once you have that connected, you would just go to, I want to add my instrument track, and we'll go to our montage so, or motif, whatever you have it set to. Uh, and then at that point, it will um, do all the handling. So... That way you don't have to run it on like the Motif audio interface. You could just take the analog outputs of your Motif and feed that into the audio interface you're using, whether it's the Focusrite or your Apollo. All right, wonderful to see Tim Weinheimer on. Glad you can make it today, as well as Grant Nicholas from Baltimore. Um, all right, so Soren asks, uh, Greg, is something happening with Cubasis for Android? I think uh, many want the functionality of iPad, iPhone, third-party VSTs working, perhaps a core track coming. Um, so I haven't heard of any developments, but I haven't been, I, I will be getting together with some of my uh, colleagues this week for, at the NAMM show, so I might be able to find out some more. But, uh, you know, I don't think that there's a lot of third-party VSTs kind of working under Android. Um, you know, it's maybe not as robust for that as iOS, um, but I know that teams are always working on new developments and stuff. So, All right, uh, so we see question. Uh, hello, how can we make doubles in the voice sound better? Um, so I'm not sure if you want to like double the voice, if that's what you want to do. Uh, but the, I can show you that. So let's say I want to come here and activate this project. So I'll just add an effects channel to this track. And there's a great plugin called Cloner. And you'll find us under modulation. on the voice this time that would help
seventh grade in the school parking lot, waiting on our yellow coach to ferry us home. You looked my way and your heart shone through. It caught my breath while you caught me too. So I would say we'll just well, just a little now, bit of this. I'm so in love with you. Just like a long, long time ago. And we get how if oh, you wanted to. I remember to. the day that we went. Seems like a long, long time ago. So we'll try. Um, and our first kiss, there was no regret. Right after that Garth Brooks show. So listen to that in context. You told your daddy. Said you were too damn good for any boy that dumb. Can we take it off in the middle? His sour words are now dead and dumb. That was a long, long time ago. So for doubling effects, you know, check out the cloner plugin, and there's a lot of great presets to kind of start with using that. Chatfield jumped on me, so let me get back. Thanks for all the great questions. And if you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure you hit the like button. All right, wonderful to see Nick on. All right, so uh, wonderful to see Jill on keys. Uh, hi, Greg. Can my MIDI keyboard play in transpose mode while playing, or do I have to change it after playing the keys, if that makes sense to you? So a lot of times people could transpose on uh, the keyboard. So let's say if I have... So if I transpose... So we could transpose using the physical keyboard. Um, and if you kind of, you know. So if I wanted to also just transpose, one of the things you could do is if you go to your uh, MIDI modifiers, and if you don't see the MIDI modifiers here, right click in the inspector, and then you'll see the MIDI modifiers. So once we're in the MIDI modifiers, there is a transpose. So if I just keep playing the same pitch, and I'll open up just the virtual keyboard so you can see. So we could just transpose. playing the same pitch. So you could do it uh, on your keyboard controller, or if it's not working on your keyboard controller, you could just do it right here in the MIDI modifiers in real time. And then as you play, it'll just transpose. All right. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so we see a question from Johnny Lizard. Uh, Hi, Greg. How to change the pitch of some hi hats in a MIDI event in a Groove Agent SE track? Okay. So you could do it from within the instrument itself pretty easily. So let's say if we'll go to this project.
So let's say I was just taking this hi-hat pattern. So I'm gonna go to the pitch. And then one of the things you could do is you could randomize the pitch. So I'm gonna just select this particular. So we select this and um, so we go to pitch. And then we could randomize the pitch or we could just go to course. Now, something else you could do is go to the pitch envelope. So let's say I want, and then I could increase my envelope amount. And then we could just add different nodes. And you could couple that with random. So if you want to listen to that in context. So all sorts of great kind of pitch shifting options. So you could do chorus. And you could even do pitch bend just on that one particular. So, and if we just take this all off to just where we were. And now adding the envelope amount. So let's say that's where we started. So let me know if that's helpful for you. But you can do all sorts of wonderful stuff with uh, pitch shifting. Okay, uh, so you see question. Um, does anyone know why is it that when I render a track, sometimes I lose sound from Cubase on all tracks and need to restart Cubase? Um, so I'm not sure if maybe the rendered track is soloed. Um, so there is a preference um, that if you render the track, um, let me just just read again. So I haven't come across that, but I know like often when you do render a track that when you like let's say if we go to render, I'm not sure if you're rendering through. Uh, render in place, but let's say if I render in place, so I'll just come here, that the original tracks can be muted by default. So if it's in a render in place, um, it could be like what you do with the source tracks. So you can keep the source tracks unchanged or mute the source tracks and maybe the source tracks are set to be muted if you're rendering through render in place. So maybe let me know if maybe that's what's causing your problem, JD. All right.
Uh, so we see from Sven Isaacson, uh, it says recording equals low buffer, playback equals high buffer. Handy feature would be preferences setting with two buffer sizes. Uh, the track arming could then switch between the low high buffer. So that's exactly what ASIO Guard does. So uh, when you just enable ASIO Guard, just the particular track itself is running at the lower buffer size. Um, you know, we can't necessarily change the buffer size on the audio interface because not all audio interfaces allow you to do it from within the program itself. But ASIO Guard does that for only tracks that are record enabled or are, are recording is running at the lower buffer. So. All right, wonderful to see Peter from Montreal. So just send me, saying welcome back to me from, so glad to see, and he says, so glad to see you and the family, you made it back safe and sound. So yeah, it was a long trip back from Hawaii, but we had a wonderful vacation. Thank you. All right, so we see a uh, question, CC80, CC81, CC87 changes every time it affects my volume faders for the track, how to stop it. Um, so it could be that, you know, maybe those, you know, if you want it, make sure that you don't, you know, uh, if you have a control surface, so maybe it's the control surface is being set to the same MIDI port that the MIDI CCs are being sent to. Um, so maybe, you know, if if you have it doubly defined as maybe a Mackie control um, and, you know, if you're using the same MIDI ports as your Mackie control, as you are for your MIDI controller, that those are affecting your track. So make sure that either in like, you know, the remote control area. So if you go to like in older versions, if you have Mackie control, if that is set up, make sure that these MIDI ports are assigned correctly. Or if you go into the MIDI remote, that when you go to add a device that these MIDI ports are set correctly as well. So, um, so try just making sure that there's probably the same MIDI port is assigned wrongly in one of those, uh, and then uh, that could be causing it. All right, we see K.O. Williams just says, thank you again, Greg. This helped me so much. Glad to help. All right, Todd Tyler uh, asks a uh, question. Is there anything in particular I need to do to set up MPE and Cubase Pro for my Rolly Rise keyboard, or is it mostly plug and play? So it's mostly plug and play, but what you need to do is get to your studio setup, uh, and you click on here, and you want to add, when you click on the plus sign, a node expression input device. So you want to say your MIDI input is coming from your Rolly Rise, then you can say, okay, my MIDI message after touch is doing this. Uh, you know, when I go, you know, horizontal, vertical, you know, I could just simply set this up here. So once you get, you know, kind of like your different motions defined here, you just set that up for your Rolly keyboard, and then it's fairly plug and play at that point. All right, so John Koskin says, pressed any like button lately, it helps keep the stream flowing. So yeah, if you learn something new, make sure that you, or yeah, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. All right, um, so you just see from uh, Bezad asks, uh, many times happened while I was working in Cubase 12 Pro, something caused that to shut down the Cubase, why Cubase 12 do not save the work we had done is Cubase 11 Pro, so it's the same features. So, but make sure if you want Cubase to auto save, just go to preferences, 
and go to uh, general and then you can set the auto save amount here. So just activate it and you can set it for however long you want it to be. So make sure that auto save is enabled and that functions the same way in Cubase 12 Pro as it did in Cubase 11 Pro. All right, great to see Benny. It seems like he made it back. All right, so Val Yu just it's just uh, leaving quick greeting, so thanks for joining. Make sure you hit the like button, so we're glad you can make it. He's going to watch it later. All right, uh, we have a question from Matt Elston. Uh, Greg, can you please show how to split a single section of volume automation up to slide it down to zero? Many thanks. Okay, so let's say we'll come here and I want to put in just a bit of volume automation. So we'll just come right here to volume. So if we want to do just a particular range, so let's say at this point, my volume is set to, let's say 5.34. So I'm gonna select a range, and then we could just move this value down. So I'm just gonna come right here, and then if I just want to say, okay, we want this to be zero, then at that point, so again, with the range tool, select a range, and then you could adjust accordingly and just adjust your your volume range so if it's below or up just grab it in the center and that will just do the selected range like so all right wonderful to see michael pierce on hope you're doing well All right, so we have a question. Uh, hi, uh, could you please show how to use poly pressure and groove agent for the symbols? It doesn't seem to do anything. Am I missing something? All right, so we could do this for like symbol chokes. So let's come over here to our, um, all right, so let's go to edit. It'll do an acoustic kit. All right, so let's say I want to come here and we'll select this symbol uh, and then so for choke we'll do poly pressure okay so let's say i'm not sure if i have poly pressure turned on my controller uh, let me see if i have polyphonic pressure on All right, so I'm going to set this to aftertouch since I have aftertouch. So a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of drum modules may have poly pressure, but if I have this set to aftertouch, my keyboard controller, now, as soon as I, as soon as I do the aftertouch, and press down that that chokes the symbol. So make sure, you know, it's probably, you know, like most keyboards don't have polyphonic pressure, uh, but some drum controllers kind of use this, uh, like you have an electronic drum kit. So maybe if you set it to aftertouch, then as soon as you hit the aftertouch, that will choke the symbol. But if you don't have polyphonic pressure, not a lot of keyboard controllers do it. Some of the Rollins have it. Uh, my Roland A80 has it. So let me know if that helps. All 
All right, so we see Michael Pierce is exporting audio for a concert for Ukrainians in front of an HRH on Thursday. Don't know which one. They're never letting me in. So congratulations on that. All right, so I just see a question. Uh, will Cubase 13 get a fix for the Groove Agent missing loops and audio? I can't see my audio in the sound browser. Um, so I'm not sure which missing loops and audio. Um, so a lot of times if you can't see it, you may you know go to the Steinberg Library Manager. So, um, but if we kind of come over here, you know, so Groove Agent doesn't necessarily come with loops. Um, and audio, but you know, I, so I'm not sure where you're doing that from. Uh, but you could also just check the Steinberg Library Manager, which is a just a utility. And let's say we go to Groove Agent and make sure that you have all of the loops here. You know, some of these loops are sold separately, but if you go to like the Steinberg Library Manager, make sure everything is downloaded. But if you have like specific loops or audio that you're missing, let me know and I could maybe see which library it is. But also go to the Steinberg Li Download Assistant And make sure that you have everything, uh, all the Groove Agent content downloaded. So, like when you have Cubase Pro 12, you can see that you'll get all this. Uh, Groove Agent content. Now there's other Groove Agent content that's available for purchase that doesn't come with Cubase. So make sure that you haven't downloaded like these because these you'll need to purchase and the ones that you'll see like in under Cubase 12, uh, those are, you know, when you see the Groove Agent SE5 content, that's all what comes with it. But if there's a particular preset that you're trying to load up that you can't have. I haven't run into any issues with that, but I, a lot of times people will download uh, Groove Agent kits that they don't have a particular, um, that they don't have a license for. So everything is free to download, but it only works if you have a license for it. So Grant Nicholas says he's used a VST amp with a wah wah with an expression pedal, works great. Okay, so we see a uh, question. I've been working on uh, UKR with binaural uh, surround project in Reaper. You can have 32 or more channels per audio file. What's the max in Cubase? Just trying to figure out, uh, get a workflow. So I think once we go to add an audio, so if you're doing binaural, we could do third order ambisonics. So as soon as we I think that might be 16, uh, but let me just, I'll just check here real quickly. So let's go to, yes, it's 16 outputs. So uh, I really haven't seen, you know, a lot of uh, ambisonic stuff that's beyond third order. I know some other programs offer it, but not that anyone really uses it. So it looks like it's 16 channels. 
for third order. Most people use, you know, first order for that. Okay, so uh, Ronin Sakal Music asks, uh, Hey Greg, why in the export MIDI I can't turn on both inspector patch and automations? And please explain what is freeze MIDI modifiers. Okay, so let's just say we export MIDI file. Okay, so this is um, can turn on both inspector patch and automations. Um, it could be that there isn't. Let me just do a new project here. That maybe there isn't any inspector patches. All right, let me just try to. Let me add, uh, go into my MIDI device manager. So now we have the, our patch list there. So let's see if that makes a difference. All right, let me just set my pan. So I'm not sure why it's grayed out, um, but it could be if you don't have the patch from the inspector set up there. Um, and kind of the question is also uh, about the freeze MIDI modifiers. So let's say if I had um, a, we go to like a MIDI insert and I had an Arpachi effect. So these notes could trigger an arpeggio, so what the freeze MIDI modifiers is, is, you know, so like these MIDI notes are triggering an arpeggio. So if I wanted to see the results of that arpeggio, we go to MIDI to freeze MIDI modifiers, and that would then embed the results of the arpeggiator uh, within the part itself. So the freeze MIDI modifiers takes into account any of the real-time MIDI plugins. But if you want to send me uh, a quick email at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I'll look into for the inspector patch and automations on.
All right, so uh, Phil Bartlett asks, uh, when is Cubase 13 out uh, in, Aus- in Australia? Uh, we're usually six months behind everything. Um, so Cubase 13 hasn't been announced yet. Uh, when it's out, it's usually done globally, and you could purchase you know, online from the Steinberg site. Um, so you, there shouldn't be any difference in Australia versus America versus Germany versus other countries. So... All right, so we have a question. Uh, can I record as Ableton live portrait mode with scenes and especially with automatic track alignment? Thank you. So there isn't kind of like the, uh, I'm not familiar what portrait mode and scenes are. I'm not Ableton user, but there isn't kind of like the little, like where you see the different cells. There isn't an equivalent of that in Cubase, but you can record uh, different parts. If you have a, tr- a tr- inspector, like if, if you wanted to take different parts and trigger them via MIDI, um, we can show you how to do different sections of a song. So let's just come here. So we could arrange different portions of a song and then trigger those via a MIDI remote or MIDI note on a keyboard. So if I'm here, uh, I could take different arranger chains. And each of, like, if we wanted to play non-linearly. All in one to kiss my face. The world was like a brand new place. Felt my feet so instead of playing straight away. linearly through. We could take each of these and trigger them from like the MIDI remote. So let's say if I wanted to go to my little nano control here, I could just say, okay, let's come. And I wanted to go to my arranger track. So we'll just go to key commands to arranger. And we'll say, okay, let's do arranger event one. Apply mapping. So now if I wanted to just come right over here and just trigger the different arrangers. So we could trigger those at different times through different MIDI messages. So you have different parts of the song. So. All right, we have Bruce Bruton checking in from Simi Valley. All right, so Braxel just says, uh, how do you record what is playing out of your computer into Cubase uh, 12 Pro? So, you know, often it's, you know, if you wanted to record uh, what's going out is you could set up kind of like a, like a group, kind of like, a, you know, a, a Some people will call it like a catch group, something like that. So what we could do is um, I'll just come here. So I'm going to select all my tracks. And let's route them to a group. So we call this like a pre-master group if you wanted to. And I'm going to make it a stereo. So now everything here is being routed to this group and we could have our effects, mastering effects. And what I could do now is add an audio track. We'll make it a stereo track. And I'm going to say, let's make it our pre-master group as the input. And then I'm just going to record. 
And now everything that's going out of my computer can now be just captured. So again, just route everything to a group before the final output. And then you could capture all of the audio that way to include in your mix down. So you give that a try. Let me know if that will work for you. All right, so we have uh, Music for World Peace Records, Taylor from uh, Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining. Great to see you on. Glad you can make it live today. All right, uh, Taylor asks, uh, in Cubase Pro 12, how do, how do I get grid lines to appear in a sampler view window in free warp? All right, so let's say if I was doing free warping here, I'm going to go to... Uh, let's say my hit points, or let's say I'll just go to my audio warp, and we do free warping. All right, so you see this little line that looks like a grid here. So as soon as I turn this on, then we'll see the grid appear. So probably just to the left of the word bar, you'll see almost like a hashtag. So turn that on, and then we could warp uh, directly kind of based on the grid here. So you can say, okay, I want this to be right on the grid. We could do that. And if we have snap turned on, we could have that just automatically kind of snap directly to the grid. Like, so it will just kind of fall and snap right in there. So once again, to see the grids, just come to grid lines in the sample editor, just click right there on this icon and then they'll appear. Okay, uh, uh, another question. In project window, the free warp, how do I erase a marker? Eraser shows with shift alt, but it doesn't erase when clicked on. Okay, so let's go ahead and make this larger so we can see it. And I'm gonna switch my tool to the free warp. So let's put some markers in. Okay, so I think if we just hold down the alt and click, that hold down the alter option key and then click on the warp marker and that will erase it. So again, uh, as we go to enter in warp marker point, if we want to erase, hold down the alt or option key and then you could just click on anywhere in the line and that will erase the warp marker for you. All right, so Luigi asks, uh, peak performance touches red even without doing anything. What can I do? So if you have plugins that are loaded up, um, you know, those plugins can take a lot of processing power if you're playing or not. One of the things that you could do if they are VST3 plugins is just to come over to preferences. And if you go to plugins, you could activate uh, suspend VST3 plugin processing when no audio signals are received. So, but you know, a lot of plugins, if you don't have that turned on, you know, those plugins could still take a lot of processing power and VST2 plugins will take processing power, whether they're processing audio or not. So maybe if you're doing VST3, then you should, um, you know, check that one particular preference. All right, so we see Devin Dennis, it says no, uh, the MIDI controller box. Let me just see if I could go back to see what uh, what it's referencing, if we could find it quickly.
Okay, so maybe it's uh, when I replace an instrument on a pad, I can no longer use the MIDI control or modulation to modify the pitch. Okay, so. I just see no the MIDI controller box. Um, So let me just see if we go to Groove Agent here, I think. So just see, no, the, um, I assume this is with no, the MIDI controller box. Um, so if we open up Groove Agent, so, so I'm not sure if you're, you know, maybe if you could Specified uh, this one for Devin Dennis would uh, know the MIDI controller box. Um, all right, uh, all right. So we see from James Bond. Uh, how can I enable read and write automation for multi-track that I select, not for all tracks? Okay, so let's say if I have multiple tracks selected here. All right, so. So we could do, all right, so let's see if we can do it with a project logical editor preset. Okay, so we're gonna say uh, is container type is equal to track. And we want to choose property is set to is selected and track operation. Let's see, read and track operation, write, enable. All right, and then we could save this. So, um, so again, we could say transform container and we could save this as a preset. So let's say, So at this point we say we want to take uh, container types are equal to tracks property property set to is selected track operation read enabled write enabled you could also choose this to toggle so if it is on you wanted them off you could do stuff like that as well so so Give that a try and you can save it as a preset and that preset can be called up from the MIDI remote or from a key command. All right, so we see um, question, I had an issue with timing on my latest project. I had some plugins, but it wasn't overloaded. I took them off and the metronome and timing of my song is wacky. Now recorded tracks aren't in time. Um, um, so I don't know what would cause that, but make sure that you know there wasn't anything like a sample rate mismatch or if you have musical mode enabled so, you know, try selecting all the events on a project window and toggling musical mode on and off. And maybe that got turned off and certain tracks were in musical mode and some weren't. 
So I, those are two things I would check, Michael, and see. But if you have a project that you want to share with me, you could you know send me like a WeTransfer link or something like that. Uh, and you could send it to uh, clubcubase at steinberg.de. I'd be happy to take a look at the project. Okay, so I see uh, some further comments from Devin Dennis. It says uh, the MIDI controller tab. Um, and then select modulation wheel. So let me just go back to the groove agent. So let's say we have this, we'll open up groove agent. Um, all right, so I think this is with pitch. Okay, so turn that down a little bit. So I'm not sure if you're, you know, so I'm not sure if you're doing the learn CC message here um, for the pitch, but that seemed to work, Devin. Maybe, maybe if you could, um, sometimes it's hard splitting out the comments. I know you probably asked, but you know, if you can give it full context, that would be helpful to me. All right, so we have a question from uh, Strict9. Uh, after freshly recording vocals, how do you just pull up sends such as compression, et cetera? So, you know, the quickest way to do it is just to go directly to uh, the channel strip. And if you wanted to, so you don't necessarily have to do it as sends, but, you know, on every channel, you have built in noise gates, you have, you know, three different compressors, channel EQ. You could have an envelope shaper or a de-esser. You could have three forms of saturation and three limiters. So that's the fastest way to do it. And, you know, these are very high quality processes. So I would definitely go there. And, you know, generally people will use, um, you know, channel inserts for compressors and sends for, like, you know, coursing, delays, reverbs, and stuff like that. But check out the channel strip because you can do – a tremendous amount kind of right here without having to instantiate third-party plugins and do it and if you wanted to switch the order of those you could just come right over here and change the order of each process as well So we see the Heartbreak Time Machine says right click, add to favorites. Oh my God, thank you. So, all right, so the Heartbreak Time Machine wants guys to smash the like button. So, all okay, so Michael asks, uh, I know my CPU is a bit old now, but is the i7 8700 okay for Cubase nowadays? You know, so it may not run like, you know, hundreds or thousands of tracks, but you could probably still get a lot of work out of it. I still have, an, like, maybe a first-generation i7 laptop that still runs great. It's probably 10, 12 years old at this point. Um, it was my travel computer until I stopped traveling with COVID, uh, but it still boots up, runs great. It's like 16 gigs of RAM. I could do a lot of work on it. All right, so we see a comment, nice comment from Braxel. 
I'm really happy you guys have the live stream for all of for all of us to ask questions. It's great. Hopefully, it's helpful for people. It's getting lots of views recently. So. All right, uh, so you just see this question was uh, directed to Jazz Dude. Uh, did the Thunderbolt ports on a new Mac Mini, can they be used for USB 3 or 3.1? Do you have to have an adapter? So they they can be used for USB 3 and 3.1, so you don't really have to have an adapter for that. My chat field just jumped. Let me just see if I catch up. All right, we see Michael Teams has made it. Al Sween wants to go out and see a Garth Brooks show after listening to my friend Wayne's song. All right, so Noah Rad asks, uh, are there like free VSTs in Cubase Elements? So yeah, Cubase Elements comes with a suite of plugins. So as you go to, as you uh, jump up to Cubase Artist or Cubase Pro, there's more plugins, but you have a really nice suite of plugins that are, uh, I think it's like 45, 44, 45 different plugins are included. So, and you can check the Steinberg website, but there's a lot of plugins that are included. See, Michael Teams has started his uh, ice cream distribution. All right, wonderful to see Mutlu from Turkey, from Istanbul. Thanks for joining today. All right, so I see from uh, Club to Breathe, track preset. Is there any way to switch audio instrument effects group presets into each other, like taking the audio channel preset, uh, the plugins chain only, and making it fill an instrument channel? Um, so when you do a track preset, what you could do is save an effects chain preset to do that. So let's say if uh, I'll just do a new project here. So track presets could be kind of, you know, designated for particular track types. So let's say I have an audio track and I have an instrument track. And I'll add a group track. Okay, so, so now if we come over here, uh, let's go to, I think we can find them in our presets. So let's go to uh, effects chain presets. So now I could take this effects chain preset, drag it to my audio track. Uh, let me just come over here. So we select our audio track and we'll go to our inserts. And I will take this same effects chain preset and drag it to my instrument track. So now we select our instrument track and we go to our inserts view here. We can just take the same effects chain presets to our different group tracks. So let's say we'll take this to our audio, to our instrument. 
And I want to take this same one to my audio. So effects chain presets are just a processing so that you can have the same processing chain. Uh, and if you wanted to have a track preset, that would be, you know, particular to audio because the track preset could contain like the phase position, you know, the phase switch, you know, gain, the MIDI could include other elements as well. But if you want just the processing, like the inserts and effects, and or the inserts and EQs and channel strip, just drag it over from FX chain presets. And I think that will do what you want. And to save an FX chain preset, once you're here, just right click, save FX chain preset. Okay. okay, just reading through. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Uh, Hi, Greg, how do, I move ch how do I move channels between two Cubase projects? Half of the same project is done on a different machine than I want to put them on in the right channels. So if you have a number of tracks that you want it to, you know, carry over, you know, from one computer to another computer, uh, an easy way to do this, let's come over to, um, we'll go through this project here. Let me activate it. Okay, so if I wanted to carry like the drums over to another project, I would just select the drum tracks and we could export selected tracks. So we could copy the media files or not. So let's say I'm just going to reference the files. We'll come over here and I'll just call them drums. All right. And I'm just going to make sure I saved it in place I know. Okay, so it's on my desktop, so I'll do a new project here, or open an existing project, doesn't matter. And then, all we, so we export selected tracks and we import a track archive. So we'll come over here and just go to drums.xml, and now we'll select all and import. So you could save that XML file on a different drive if you wanted to. So if they're on two different computers, just save it to like a USB flash drive or upload it to the cloud, whatever you wanted to do. See Patrick saying uh, today's live stream is great. So glad it's been, been helpful for people. All right, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button, and Yaren Bahar says hi to everyone. Thanks for joining today. Michael Teams just says, glad you're back. Hope your vacation was wonderful for all involved. Yeah, we had a wonderful time. We went to Maui for a week, uh, and it's hard to have a bad time in Maui. It's just so incredibly relaxing and highly recommend it if anyone's looking for a good vacation spot. All right, uh, so we see, uh, my name is Neil. It's my first time here. So thanks for joining us. Uh, just got Cubase Pro 12. For somebody like myself who does not like a metronome, is there a way to record my parts and then beat map them? Yeah, so if, so let's say I'm going to come here to a particular project and uh, let's say I record it and this is just like a two track mix, but you could take anything that's 
kind of been recorded. Uh, but let's say this isn't lined up to a grid per se, so. So I put my metronome on. So what I could do is I'm just going to select the particular event. Um, and now I just go to my project and we'll say tempo detection and we'll say analyze. So now we could have the grid follow the performance. So if you, and if we have like a pickup note, so we'll say this is our downbeat here. So as we go. Yeah, maybe that's not our downbeat, so let me just. So and at that point, we could just so let's say we have just our pickup note. So at that point, we could just come right over there and and have that automatically follow the grid. And if we wanted that to be steady at this point, I could select that particular file and we'll say go to audio menu and we'll say advanced and we'll say set definition from tempo. And now as we play, like I say, I want this to be uh, perfectly 128 beats a minute. Now it's perfectly in time. Or if I wanted to be steady and faster. So once again, just select the audio or MIDI event, get a project and do tempo detection. And then you, you could have the grid follow your musical performance. And welcome to the live stream, Neil. And we hope to see you on future live streams. All right, so we see a question. Uh, hi, is there an option to make presets to say record in Able for several tracks? Okay, so let me just. Maybe I'll just revert this. So a couple ways to approach this is uh, one is using uh, so a couple of two two different approaches that you could take. I'll just revert this back. So one is if you have a folder, so like here I have all my drum tracks in a folder, so you could right click to add a folder track. Um, and then if you record and enable the folder that you could just every track within the folder can be record enabled just like that. Now, if I wanted to link, another way is just to link channels together. So let's say I want to take these two guitars and we could create a link. Uh, 
So we just click on the link and we could also just say, I don't want to necessarily just do um, volume, but I just wanted to record, enable, and monitor. So at this point, as soon as I record and enable on one of the tracks, the other one will automatically be record enabled. But you'd have to set up the link in the mixer or just simply put it into a folder. So those are two different approaches. Michael Teams uh, says, uh, howdy, Greg, are you ready for a new song for me? So, yeah, I, uh, I know I still have to do bass on the other one. I have Nam Show and then shortly after that, Corporate Kickoff. So I might get to it towards the end of April, but I would love to get a new song, Michael, to play bass on. All right, so we just see a uh, question from Phil Baxley. Um, Hi, Greg. Uh, cheers from Croatia. I have Mac OS, Big Sur, iMac, and just connected Nectar Impact LX61 Plus, which keeps crashing my Cubase 11 Pro. Should I go to Nectar support or upload a crash dump to Cubase? I would say that if it is, um, if it works fine without the keyboard connected and then you connect it, um, that if that's the case, then I would probably send it to Nectar. If that's kind of, um, you know, if that's what's causing the crash, I would send it there. It seems sensible. See Michael Teams, uh, I see got a new General Music Equinox keyboard. So I have a General Music S2R, which I love, but I think the battery is shot like most of my hardware rack pieces. But I, I really enjoyed the I really enjoy the General Music S2R. One great great keyboard sounds. Okay, so we see question from Michael W. Um, how can I handle in the project logical editor an input parameter and an out parameter as well? Is this possible? Um, so I'm not sure if you want to set an input and an output for a track. So let me just add a couple of group tracks here. Uh, I'll just add destination. So let me add Group track. Okay, so let's say on this track, I want to set the input uh, to mono into and to the output to group to. Okay, so let's see if we could do that. So we'll come over here to the project logical editor. Okay, so we'll say our container type is track and we'll just make it selected. So we'll say property is set to is selected and let's go to track operation connect output so i wanted to go to group two and we'll go to insert track operation connect input and we'll say mono into all right so we go to this base track we're in mono in 13 and stereo out uh, 
And we can see mono in two uh, and to group two. So again, um, you want to choose transform. Container type is equal to track. You can make it selected or not. I, I chose select it. And then we say track operation connect output to group two, whatever output that you want. Track operation connect input to any input that you want as well. So let me know if that's helpful. That was Michael from Germany asked that question. Thanks for being on the live stream. All right, uh, so we see Samuel asks, uh, Dolby has released a new version of Atmos Renderer version 5. What is the version of the renderer in Cubase and how it will follow the releases? Um, so I'm not sure if it needs to necessarily follow the releases, you know, because it is just rendering the Dolby Atmos file. Um, but I may be able to get some more information this week when some, I get to meet up in person with some of my colleagues at the NAM show. Um, but, you know, regardless of Dolby releasing a new Atmos renderer, you know, the one in Cubase is still going to work and export uh, and create ADM files that are compatible. All right, um, so we have a question. Uh, please explain about reverbs and sound selection for arrangements. Um, so, I mean, it's always, you know, incredibly subjective is like what instruments sound good for particular arrangements. And after a while, you, you know, people will have kind of their go-to uh, particular sounds that they'll use. Um, so reverbs, a lot of people have grown up listening to plate reverbs over the years. And sometimes, you know, stuff can sound, you know, like sounds can sound, you know, very good to our ears uh, when we are actually, I'll just revert this, you know, when it's something we've heard a million times. You know, I often make kind of the comment that, you know, if transistor amps came out before tube amps that, you know, There'd be a lot of transistor amp purists uh, trying to get the transistor sound out of out of a tube amp. It's just because we've all grown up listening to this. So plate reverbs are always kind of a good place uh, to start because it's kind of a very familiar sounding reverb. So if we want to take kind of. Do you recall the day we first met? That was a long. So if we wanted to take like our vocal here and solo it. It was seventh grade in the school parking lot, waiting on our yellow coach to ferry us on. You look my way and your heart shone through. So if we wanted to come over here and just go to the send. So here we're going to have um Well leaving now, I'm so in love with you. Just like a long, long time ago. So this is Dutch Concert Hall that we're just using here. Oh, I remember the day that we went. Seems like a long, long time But ago. when you go to Cubase, there's all sorts of great plates that are available. Our first kiss, there was no regret. Right after that So maybe you can start like three seconds. You told your daddy and he called my mom. Said you were too damn good for any boy. A little delay, so let's say, okay, we'll get to our verb here. His soured words are now dead and done. That was a long, long time ago. So let's listen to it in context. Now our two grown daughters are married with kids of their own. And 
here's a plate just on a guitar. So a number of different kind of ways to get access to, you know, but, you know, try starting with like a plate reverb and, uh, and go from there. And that's always kind of a good starting off place. So if you wanted to just look at uh, what reverb is on a plate, that's the reverence and that's a four second plate. Um, so, you know, check out some of those. Um, but every song could require different reverbs. You know, try not to use like six different reverbs, all different sizes. It can be kind of confusing for the listener. Um, and, you know, stuff now can be a lot more organic sounding. Like in 80s, there was a lot more reverb because digital reverbs were new. And you could create these environments that you could never do before. And people may have abused uh, reverbs at the time. So. All right, so we see uh, from Michael Pierce um, about the ambisonics. Uh, so it says fifth order, which is 32, but third would do. Uh, they also have a 27 output surround speaker array to address, uh, but I reckon I can help with that. So if you're doing the window, um, you know, there you could have additional speaker configurations. So let me just jump to new window here real quick to show you so there's some more advanced speaker configurations. I'm pretty sure you have a Nuendo license that you took advantage of during one of the promotions. So we'll just show this. I have to get it updated to the latest version. So once you're inside a Nuendo and you go to uh, your outputs, let's go to your audio connections here. That when we so here you get twenty two point two surround and others so you can get uh, some more extensive uh, surround support here as well so Nuendo will have some more ex extended surround formats All right, so we see AJ sound bites. Just wishing everyone well. through comments. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Hope, and if you've learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. All right, so we see, um, is there a question? Uh, is there a way to reset the playback cursor to the left of the screen on stop? Uh, have it set in preferences to return on stop rather than the middle as it does currently? Um, all right, so let's say if, I'll just go to a different project here.
All right. So if you want, you know, so if you want to, if you if you have a numeric keypad, which is I always recommend to get with Cubase. So let's say we hit play. And if I hit, you know, because if you hit the space bar, that's going to be start and stop. And we could choose to have it in preferences, go back to our start position. Or if we come over to our preferences to transport, we could have um, return to start position on stop. So now if I hit stop, it'll just go, it'll stop directly there. But if I hit the zero key on the numeric keypad, I can just stop. And if I hit it again, since it's not in a toggle, like start, play, start, play, start, play, I could hit play. If I hit zero once, it stops in its current position. I hit zero again. And then if I hit the period key, that takes me to the beginning. So even if I'm playing, let's say I'll fast forward here. So let's say I hit the enter key to play. So I stop. So I hit zero on a numeric keypad that stops it in its position. Hit it again, that takes it back. I hit the period key between the zero and the enter, and that takes me right back to the beginning. So even if I'm playing I could just go right back to the beginning of the project just by hitting the period key on the numeric keypad. So, so try that, try using the numeric keypad if you have one. If you don't have one, buy a keyboard has it. There's all sorts of great keys that you're missing and functions. All right, so we see uh, from Groove Records asked, uh, hello, sir, I have Cubase 10 Pro and I use it on my studio and also on my MacBook. Uh, it's hard to carry the dongle every time. Is there any way that I can activate 10 and not moving the dongle every time? So uh, Cubase 10 will require the USB E licensor. Um, if you upgrade to Cubase 12, you could run that on up to three computers and does not require the USB E licensor. So, um, so you'll need to, if you want to do that, you could upgrade to uh, to version 12. So, but it will need a physical USB E licensor to run. Okay, uh, so we see uh, Braxel asks, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to know how you record audio like YouTube, sounds that are not coming from Cubase 12 Pro that are playing through your interface. Uh, sorry for not being clear. So I'm sorry for my misunderstanding. So there is, like, I think, like Voice Meter Pro. I think, um, you know, I think Jazz, you just mentioned that. So Voice Meter Banana is a utility that you could kind of route audio from like you know a web browser into cubase so you could try that some people have a hard time getting it to work um but you, you could give a utility like that a try so i know a lot of people just take the you know an audio output from their built-in audio interface and have that connected to their uh computer audio interface and just record the straight audio out as well Okay, uh, so we have a question uh, from Mike Weiser. Uh, for some reason, in Cubase 12 Pro, I try and place left and right locators using key commands, but it doesn't work. It ends up highlighting the numbers in the left right locator box on the on the button bottom screen. Okay, so let me just see. If, uh, let's see if it's just. Hmm. 
just remind myself of the key command here real quick. All right, so let's say we get a shift L. That's the key command. All right, so when you do that, it you know when I hit Shift L, it'll just you know take you to enter in. So I say I want to be at measure twenty one, and that will extend. And then if we hit Shift R, you know I say okay, I want this to be at measure sixty one that it will just extend right there. Other ways to do it is if you want it to, you know, do it around a part. So if you have part selected, hit the letter P. If you have a range selected, hit the letter P and that will set the left and right locators. But you know, when you hit Shift L, Shift R, that just allows you to enter in. And if you hold down, um, you know, Alt or Option and click up top that will put in the left locator or if you click command or control and click on top that will enter in the right locator so a couple of different ways to enter in your locators let me know if that's helpful All right, so we see King Drew 562 says foreign language territory a bit too advanced for my Cubase knowledge at the moment, but I'm watching anyway. So uh, ask any question you want, King Drew 562. All right. All right, uh, so we see a uh, question. Uh, hi, Greg. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, in the MIDI key editor, is there a way to show what keys are being played as the MIDI notes scroll? All right. So let me just go to part here. So let's say, okay, I have some MIDI notes here. Okay, so once we look at it in the key roll editor, so let's say as we look at this. So if you're, depending on your zoom factor, you know, you could actually see, so let's say we're just, Kind of zooming in here, you could actually see the note names. Uh, but if you're kind of your horizontal zoom is off, like let's say if you're like that, as we get closer, like right there, we don't see the notes, but a little larger, you could actually see. So you could actually see just the notes on the, you know, the notes are each labeled. So, so try that and let me know if that's helpful for you. Sorry, my chat field just jumped. 
All right, so I think I'm close. Um, okay, so we have a question uh, from Tommy Valenko. Uh, question, why can't I find my pre presets for reverence anymore? All right, so the first thing I would do is go to Media Bay and let's go to uh, VST Sound. So we'll just maximize this. And we'll come over here to VST Sound. And then I think we'll see, um, let's see if it's in here. Make sure I'm not missing it here. Refactory content. So let's try to go to um, So yeah, so go Media Bay, Factory Content to VST three presets. And you'll see reverence listed here. So make sure one that it's checked and just come right over here, right click and choose to rescan disk. And that will rescan through all of the different IR files and presets. So try that. So we see uh, Club to Breed just says, thanks a lot, uh, FX Chain preset to be used with any type of track. So. All right, um, so we see question, uh, is there any settings that causes my pan to move by itself? So if you want it, your pan to move by, by itself, uh, I'm not sure if you want to do it, but you could come over here and let's just use, we'll go to an audio insert plugin. So let's say we want to go to, and spatial panner, there's an, um, it's just, I'll just get to auto pan here under modulation, so we'll go to auto pan. So now we could. And we could have this sync to the project. So you say, okay, I want this to be. So you could uh, try to experiment with that plugin, but let me know if it's uh, you didn't want, if it's panning, uh, something is causing it to pan unwanted. Let me know that as well. All right, uh, so we see from a question, multiple screen question. Um, is there a quick way to focus on a particular screen without clicking with a mouse, uh, i.e. MIDI controller, et cetera? So one of the things you could do is make it an active window. So a lot of times people may have like their mix console uh, on one screen and their Cubase project on another screen. So if you wanted to make that the active window, what you could do is one is just 
go to your and I don't have multiple screens on my on the live stream here. Um, but if we go to the MIDI remote, let's come over here and I'm just going to set this for, um, and we'll just say mix console. So let's go to key commands and let's go to devices. All right, so we've got key commands and devices and then we'll see mixer. All right, so I'm going to assign that to, and let's say my second button, I want this and this function, if you want to make the project window, the active window, um, there's a project bring to front command. So I'm going to come over here, select that. So now I open up uh, my mix console window, and then if I hit the secondary button, that brings it to the front and that will make it the active window of focus. So if you want the project window, choose bring to front. If you want the mix console window to be active, you know, just open up mixer from devices. Okay, so, um, all right, so more follow-up with our pitch bend question. Uh, when you go to Groove Agent 5 SE on the pitch tab next to the pitch bend, pitch bend wheel, there's a drop-down menu with a heading called MIDI controller. When I switch to modulation, which controls the modulation wheel, uh, if I replace the pad, then the modulation wheel can no longer stay. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Let's take a look at it. So let's come over here to our urban ballads. Okay, so let's say I want to come here to the instrument. Okay, so we say modulation here. All right, and I'm just gonna replace a different sample yeah so that will be kind of set for the pan um but let's see so i mean you could always do Let's see if I just have my pitch bend set or if that's going to be. So that will reset. Um, I'll pass that along, but you could always just come over here and just kind of change the pitch. I can see where it's going to be kind of for the particular sample. Um, I'll pass that along um, just so people are aware of it. I'm not sure if it's a particular design intention, but thank you for the clarification on that. But if I just choose modulation and as we play the pattern here. That it, I see it does get reset and you have to kind of turn it on again. 
So I can see where that could be a little annoying. Thanks for your clarification, Devin. Okay, so we have a question. In film composition, I would like to preserve the MIDI piano improvising timing to the film. How can I save the MIDI event and adjust the grid to it? Thanks. Okay, so let's say if I have, um, I'll just come. See if I still have this one project I'm thinking of. All right, I'll just open it up. Okay, so uh, let me just find kind of a piano project. I'll just drop a film to. Okay, so I'm gonna add, we'll import a video here. Okay, so let's say this is our Okay, so it says, uh, I want to preserve the MIDI piano improvising timing to the film. How can I save the MIDI event and adjust the grid to it? So what you could do is just simply come, so say we want this. So one of the first things you could do is just lock the event so A doesn't move. And now if I wanted to lock the grid, like bars and beats to it, we would just select the warp tool and we would choose warp grid. So at this point I can say, okay, I want this measure 16 to be here, measure 12 to be here, measure 11 on this. And at this point, the original MIDI is still playing back at the same time, but we could now move the grid to automatically fit the timing of the MIDI event. So this stays locked in time and now we just simply come over here and physically move the bar where we want it to be laid out and we create the grid based on the piano improvisation. So make sure you're not in free warp but you're in warp grid and then you could just move the measures to where the piano events are. And you can do this in the editor or just do it directly on the project window itself. All right, so we see uh, Datuch says, uh, that's awesome, thank you so much. Excited to learn more, definitely coming as much as I can, so. And you could watch, you know, they're all available if you go to youtube.com slash Cubase and just go to live. All right, uh, so Michael Teams uh, asks, uh, howdy, Greg, uh, how about showing a simple template build? Okay, so let's say we want to build a template. Okay, so we'll do a new project. Um, so it could really depend on like what projects you what you want in your template. So we'll start off. Let's say, okay, I wanted to um, come over here. Let's add, let's say six mono tracks, and I want to. And I'll just keep this open. Let's add a stereo track. Okay, I wanted to add three mono tracks. I want to add two stereo tracks. So I'll just come here. 
Um, I want to add, let's say, a Hyun Sonic, and I want this to be, you know, for pianos. Um, So, and at this point, I want to add three MIDI tracks. All right, so my first one, I want this to be, let's say a piano. So I'll just come in here, so say S90. All right, and then I want a Rhodes. Maybe strings. Let's say Brass and strings. Right. All right, so now as I I got strings and brass, and I want piano. Okay, so, and let's go ahead and add a, we'll add, uh, just add an effect track. So I wanted a reverb. and a delay. Okay, so I want to name some of these tracks. So let's say, okay, kick, and I'll just hit the tab key, snare, hat, high tom, Low Tom, Floor Tom, Overheads, we'll say Guitar, Bass, Vox, and then we'll say Piano, we'll call this you know, roads, strings, and we'll say we didn't add a separate brass, but we'll add a brass. Okay, so let's say I want to take my drums and put those into a folder. I will just come right over here. Let's right click um, and we'll say move tracks select the tracks to folder and we'll call this drums and let's go ahead and add some groups so if i was doing maybe a band this could be like kind of a typical layout and at this point we could now uh, just come right over here and then we'll choose save as template We'll call it Michael Teams and hit OK. And now when we do a new project, we'll come over here to Next. We'll choose Michael Teams. We'll choose a folder where we want all the audio files to be stored to and hit Activate. And now we have our folder set up. And it could be like your studio drum kit, studio piano, whatever you want, whatever instruments. And then you could just start directly from there.
All right. Um, so he says, uh, just see from Algis um, Romanowskis. Uh, it says, I have a hunch Media Bay is flawed by preferences, autosave, set more than two minutes and too many backup files. Uh, you should check this in Steinberg after I ditched old profile manager. I set a uh, two minute autosave and 10 backup files and preferences. Media Bay got healed. Um, so I'll check it out and see, but I haven't run into any problems with that. But one of the things is to make sure also that when you open up Media Bay, sometimes people don't allow it to do to uh, one of the preferences for Media Bay is just to when you open it up that it's only scanning when Media Bay is open. So sometimes it may be constantly scanning in the background. So may, see if that preference is checked. And so it may be make make sense to try to uncheck it. All right, so we see Michael W says uh, thanks. Uh, says thanks. I meant a string input parameter, which I could use in a logical action. So if you wanted to enter in, like you know, prompt for a name and then enter that in, um, then that I don't know a way of doing that. All right, so we see Ken Allen won't be making it to the NAM show this year. So sorry, we'll miss you, but glad that you can make the live stream. All right, uh, so we just see Machine Age Voodoo ask, Hi, Greg, wouldn't it be great if Steinberg slash Yamaha would put out a new DAW mixer controller? So many people would be interested. Yeah, uh, Yamaha just announced on Thursday the Yamaha DM3, which is a mixer and a DAW controller, so check that out. Uh, it could work over Dante or it could work over USB. So you could use it as your control surface. You could record directly from it and use it as your control, you know, Use as your audio interface as well. All right, so I know we had some questions that were mailed in. Let me get to those before we run out of time. Thanks, everyone, for all the great questions today. Let me just get to some of these questions quickly. All right, uh, so uh, hi, Greg. Just, uh, greetings from Ireland. Firstly, thank you so much for all the amazing effort you put into providing such incredible resources to your customers. As a new Cubase user, the information and support you offer through all the different channels is absolutely invaluable. I'm using Cubase 12 Pro on Windows, and apologies, this has been asked before, but I was wondering if it is possible to activate the metronome without starting playback record. Uh, as a workaround, I normally leave one bar at the beginning of my project blank and play that uh, bar in a continuous loop while I'm practicing. Uh, is this the best only option or am I missing something? Uh, for more complex projects with tempo, time signature changes that I may wish to practice straight through, I would normally mute all non-relevant tracks and play back the progress so that the metronome follows the tempo track. Uh, starting playback makes sense to me in this scenario as I'm doing a run through or an actual song. Um, uh, it is just when I want to freely write practice for an in indefinite period at a fixed tempo that I click, it would make sense to be able to start the metronome independently of playback. So, so the metronome is going to be tied to the playback, but I mean, you could still just hit record and sequence everything and record everything. Um, but I mean, Cubase doesn't work as a metronome per se. It works as the metronome is going to, you know, sound while Cubase is playing, which I think makes sense. Um, but there isn't a way to, you know, have have the metronome sound. Um, you know, I guess you could create a groove agent, you know, click track if you wanted to, and then use that as a basis and have that play independently without the project playing. So if you just take different sounds um, in Groove Agent and make a pattern of that, at that point you could make a click track that plays back as an independent Groove Agent sequence. Okay, so we have a question. Um, 
Hi, Greg. Uh, after opening the tracks on the mixer and selecting pre, is there a way to connect the pre gain in the main mixer page to a controller? All right, so let's open up our main mixer here, and let's say we have our pre section. So I'm gonna come over here, let's go to my racks, and we'll make sure the pre is turned on. All right, so as soon as we go to the pre, and if I wanted to adjust the gain, um, all you'd have to do is right click, and we can say pick up for MIDI remote mapping. Okay, so I want my fader, this fader to control the pre. So at this point, I could just apply the mapping and now we could just adjust the pre on that particular channel if we wanted to do this on the selected channel. Um, so if I select a different channel, so let's say I, I go here, so we could map that pre. But if we go to um, our mapping assistant again, so let me just come over here. And let's go to selected track. Uh, and let's see if the pre. So if we go to gain, so now I'm going to take this fader and adjust gain. So when we go to whatever mixer channel that we're on, so let's say we'll get F3. I have this track selected. I move the fader, I have this track selected, I move the fader, we can adjust accordingly just that easily. So again, um, if you go, if you wanna do it on selected channels, just come to the remote control and then you could map and go to selected channels to uh, input filter and then you'll see gain and then you can do that on it anytime you have a channel selected you can move a fader and adjust that all right so a question um is there a way to lock the stationary scroll from turning off um so there isn't necessarily a way to lock it that i know of i mean you could turn it on and if you're not familiar with the stationary scroll some people kind of prefer this methodology of kind of working. So let's say if we're playing along here and we could activate and make this kind of a stationary cursor. So instead of the waveforms redrawing, so I'll just turn this on. So there isn't necessarily a way of locking it, but I mean, if you don't change it, it's not going to change. So, you know, if you hit F, you could turn it on and off just like that. But, um, you know, I'm not sure. So it, unless you specifically tell it to change, it will stay in that mode. So, um, so but there isn't necessarily a way to permanently lock it into that mode. All right. Um, all right, so a question. Uh, is there an easy way to use a single MIDI track and output the MIDI signal to more than five different destinations? If I understand correctly that a MIDI track, there is only a main output and four usable MIDI sends, right? Is there a workaround? Context. Uh, I have a MIDI track with all the drums is one big event. Uh, I set the output of my drum VSTI, load it as a rack instrument. I am also trying to use the same MIDI track event for many instances of Steven Slate Trigger 2 at the same time, uh, MIDI input mode. Since Trigger 2 is not really an instrument, I have to insert it on the normal audio track and send the MIDI signal from the main MIDI track to the MIDI input of every Trigger 2 plugin I have in my project, which could be more than five. Um, so one of the things that you may want to try if you do this in a drum editor, uh, I may have a project kind of showing this.
Okay, so let's say I have like maybe backbone is a kick. I'm gonna have maybe I want to use that. I have an acoustic kit. And let's say I have Latin percussion and maybe orchestral percussion. And maybe kind of like a B box. All right, so what I did is I just created uh, a blank, a just a MIDI track. And what I want to do is go to uh, my drum map area. And we're going to go to drum map setup and I'm going to create a, an empty map. So we'll do, let's say a new map and we'll call it multi. Okay, and when we do this, um, I may want to hold down control or command and switch these all to MIDI channel one. Um, now, once we do this and I have, let's say just a quick MIDI part here. So, and I wanted to be able to access all of these sounds from a particular, from one single event. We'll come over here to our drum map. And I could say, I want this to come from backbone. So I'm gonna come right over here and let's add our backbone kit. And maybe I wanted a snare to come from, let's see, we come here, let's say acoustic, I want a techno kit. And maybe on my techno kit, I want it, um, And let's say I now want, um, so let's say I go to D1 and I want D1 to come from uh, my acoustic kit. And I wanted uh, F sharp one to come from the acoustic kit. And I wanted uh, orchestral percussion. So now what you could do is as we come over here, let me just turn that off real quick. Let me just reset. So once you're in the drum editor and you set it to a MIDI track, you could go to any MIDI output to any MIDI channel, to any MIDI pitch right here. So you could have 128 different destinations within a drum track itself. Because each drum MIDI drum part could be mapped out where each sound could come from different sources. So let me know if that would work for you. All right, uh, so we see, um, hi Greg, I recorded a track using the volume pedal to control the fade in of some string parts I played. I can see it in the track as vertical line, strings two and a snapshot. Um, I w but I would like to somehow control them or remove them from the track. Uh, is there a way to do that for some reason? Uh, later on in the track, the volume lowers for no apparent reason and comes back in later. So I'd just like to eliminate to see if that is causing the problems. I have a Yamaha FC7 plugged into the foot controller input of my montage to modulate the volume. So I'm using Cubase 12 Pro on my Windows machine. All right, so if we have like a MIDI part, so let's say that we have MIDI CC7, let's say, so we'll come over. Um, and we'll just draw in some MIDI notes here. And let's say we have 
CC7. So main volume, so we have this going on and maybe we have some modulation going on. So, right, so we have all this. So one of the things that you could do is just come over here. So you'll see we have a little diamond to the left. So if you just kind of click in this little arrow, we have a little diamond. Um, so you could see kind of all of the available controllers. So if we go to main volume, at this point, we could just select all of the main volume and just delete, hit the backspace or delete key. Or if you double click on the first event while holding down shift, you could also select um, all that. So, but you know, you can see what MIDI controllers are there and just select and then just backspace delete and see if that resolves it. It could be that it's maybe a different controller depending on what the uh, keyboard is transmitting, but you could just try to erase it like that and I'll probably take care of it for you. All right, uh, so we see, uh, hello, I'm using Cubase Pro 12. I've set up a song project that has many music tracks, both instrumental and audio tracks. Uh, it has one vocal track. I want to create a karaoke version of my song, which means I want to keep all the tracks except the vocal track and the audio mix down MP3 file. Uh, I've failed. I've tried many different ways to do so. Mute the vocal track and then export an audio mix down. Uh, back up the project to a different directory and completely delete the vocal track. Then in, then export an audio mix down. In both cases, the resulting mix down file contains the voice. I'm stumped. So it sounds like what you're doing should be working, but make sure that there's no other tracks that could be still playing. So let's go back. Um, and I wanted to do just, uh, we'll do this project here. And I'll just uh, revert this. All right, so here I have background vocals. So this is often called like a TV mix or karaoke mix. So I will. Tell your daddy to call mama. All right, so I'm going to mute my lead vocal part here and we'll hear some like background vocals all right so now i'm going to i'll just do a small section to save time so let's just come and I'm going to export audio mix down with this. Actually, mute it and we'll go to export audio mix down. And we'll export and put that into a track. And now we'll listen to this and so I just added the background vocals, but none of the lead vocal. So make sure you don't have it routed anywhere else or as an input, something like that with your audio interface or routed to a group that may be able to kind of cause some issues like that. All right, uh, question. Uh, is there a way for Cubase to remember the names of tracks and color them the same? For example, I have my strings. I always want red. I would love it to be colored red every time. I have my template for large projects, but sometimes I like to start with a clear slate. 
Um, so what you could do is say, okay, anytime that there's a track called base that has, you know, we go to a project logical editor. So we'll come over here and say, okay, let's get to our setup and we'll say, um, so we'll say name contains base and we'll go to insert and say, Let's make this um, set color to fix the value. And I want all my base to be green. So now we see my base track here. I will just come over here and hit apply. And now that can change the color. So you could save all these as one particular uh, preset for strings this color and you know have presets and then have all those run as a macro and hit one button and the colors will automatically be populated for you. All right, um, so let's see, I don't think we have time for this next question, so uh, I'll do it on the live stream for next Friday. It's about selecting inserts, but I'll answer via email. <clears throat> so once again, I wanna thank everyone for a lovely live stream. If you, uh, again, Friday, I will be at the NAMM show, so if anyone is at the NAMM show, please stop by the Yamaha booth. I'll be in kind of a content creator station. Uh, answering questions, but please feel free to stop by. Uh, but we'll be doing the next live stream, not this Friday because it's the NAM show, but a week from Friday. So uh, we hope to see everyone then. Everyone, please stay safe and healthy, and we'll see everyone, I believe it's April 21st. Please take care and goodbye.